tonight's a study session agenda, so we don't have public comment. We'll just go straight into the discussion items. Do we have a staff presentation on the off-leash dog? I'm Romero, County Council. Steve Rover, Parks Development Operations Manager. So tonight I wanted to give you a, a quick update on what's been going on uh, discussing the potential of a dog park in the city of Burien. And uh, to date we've had, uh, well let me kind of backtrack a little bit here. When I, when I first came here actually about three plus years ago, I was surprised coming from the agency I did down south that there wasn't a dog park here in Burien. And real quickly it was obvious that Seattle was very <coughs> popular and cities around us, they were, they were real popular. And we started getting some emails and uh, phone calls from, from the folks uh, asking why we don't have a dog park. And myself and the park board had actually been discussing it a bit for the last uh, year and a half before it really came to the head recently. So just a quick background, uh, all through 2012, uh, myself and the park board talked about the potential of a dog park. Uh, the B-Town Dog Group got kind of organized around August, September and contacted myself and contacted, actually came to the city council between September and October, they came to the park board as well as the city council, requesting that we look into the potential, the feasibility of getting a dog park. Uh, in uh, December, a group really interesting saw it in the news after a city council meeting called LA Studio, and I really want to mention these guys. It's a uh, landscape architect firm out of Renton that uh, is doing some pro bono work for me. And they, they're actually the ones that are making the, the, the slides you'll see tonight, the visuals for me. They're helping me put together design work uh, so I'd have some presentation materials to bring to your, you and the public. Uh, in uh, February of 13, staff and uh, the consultants, as well as some of the park board members, went to various park sites and evaluated which ones have the best potential for dog parks. And, and really what we're looking for was uh, pretty much unutilized parks that were under our control. So we're, we're trying not to look at parks that weren't ours yet, that, you know, potential future parks we can get from other agencies or ones we had 40-year agreements with uh, to use their land. But we wanted to look at parks that were ours, that were underutilized, and uh, you know, pretty much being unused and had some space. Uh, in uh, March 13th, I had my first real public meeting where we came forward and uh, presented two site layouts at two parks. And the two parks we brought up were Salmon Creek Park and Hazel Valley Park. Okay, before I get into that, I just want to say why, why a dog park is important real quickly. A uh, dog park has a lot of positive social aspects for the, for the owners especially as well as for the dogs. It's, it's a real big social network. Uh, it provides a forum for information, especially with a group like CARES or some of the other dog ownership groups and educational opportunities. We would have a, a location to hold classes and things like that and share information. Uh, the increased positive park activity, especially in a park where we might have some concerns or issues currently with vandalism, graffiti, that sort of thing, it kind of helps eliminate those negative impacts when you got a bunch of good folks with their dogs out in the park all day. Uh, currently, we have some real active volunteers that are willing to promote and help with the park maintenance and actually help with getting the park going. And lastly, the existence of a dog park in any community is an asset and it would make a city like Gary more desirable to live in. I truly believe that. Uh, from my past experience before I came here, I designed and built six dog parks in my previous life and I, I see how they evolve and I see the impact they make to the parks and I see the uh, positive aspects of dog parks. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, two sites we looked at were Salmon Creek Park and Hazel Valley Park. Uh, Salmon Creek's up off of 118th, just uh, to the west of 4th Avenue, but towards the north end of Burien. It's just under five acres, that site. And then the Hazel Valley Park site is just uh, one residential lot away from uh, Puget Sound Park off of 4th Avenue by 126. Okay, when we looked at the, the two sites, we wanted to look at the opportunities and constraints, and this is before I met with the public. Uh, the opportunities we saw at, at Hazel Valley Park were there's an exi existing path. There wasn't a whole lot of structural use there. There used to be an old playground before we got from King County, but that was gone. So pretty much what was going on there, were, the public was walking that, that trail was the, the main use, as well as also bringing their dogs to that park and let them run off leash. 
there's existing fencing uh, surrounding uh, three out of four sides of the park. There's the existing park furnishings, tables and benches, and there's actually a water source at this particular site, a water meter up on 126 that we could use. The constraints would, would be that the site, the dog park would take up most of the site for sure, just to get a decent sized dog park that people would be happy with. Uh, it does abut residential houses, especially there on the east side, where we're in their backyard, uh, pretty, pretty close to their backyard. It is our fence, and then a lot of them have their second fence on their private property. Uh, there's limited parking actually up on, on 126, except if you just go, like, say, one lot over, just to the east towards Puget Sound Park, there's all kinds of street parking, and we have a lot of parking there at Puget Sound Park. And that walk from a car is really no more than any other dog park you'd, you'd go to really to expect people to keep it on a leash. Uh, obviously, we, we will eliminate the use of that pathway if we built a dog park and cut this park in half. Uh, the, there is some lim limited visibility from 126 or 128 looking into the park. It's kind of a long, narrow park. And uh, probably the other one that we heard quite a bit from uh, one or two neighbors was some of the neighbors were allowed, it looks like, to put a gate in the King County fence around the park so they have direct access from their backyard into the park. Uh, if, if we were to build a dog park and it was, their area was within that, they wouldn't be able to just go in and out. That would be kind of a security concern with the dogs from the wild. The other side is uh, Salmon Creek. It's a little bit bigger park. Uh, the majority of the park space would remain open as it currently is because it's quite a bit bigger. Both these sites we're proposing would be about an acre and a half, and I'll show you the layouts in just a second. There's quite a bit of parking on 118th. Uh, however, when I'll show you the slide about what the neighbors had to see, I understand there are some conflicts potentially with a school programming of the field across the street. Uh, there's only one resident that's directly abuts the space and it's this house right here. Uh, otherwise, we either got a street like 118th or we have the private street on, on 6th Avenue there. Uh, and some of the folks, I'll, I'll tell you about some of their concerns as well. Uh, there's some real nice mature wooded areas here that we'll make use of, so there'll be some shade. Uh, the constraints are there's no existing fencing, so this site, differently than Hazel Valley, I'd have to put in a lot more fencing. Uh, there's no existing pathway to get to it from the street or inside of it. And there's no existing water meter, so that would be an additional cost if we were to go on this one. And it's further away from the city center and away from the upper arterial. So if you're living in downtown, you're in a more than cluster <coughs> downtown, uh, it'd be a farther drive for you to get to this site. Okay, let me go through Hazel Valley real quick. So just to get you orientated, uh, First Avenue is kind of the lower end of the slide. This is 126, and then 128th is over on this side of the park, and then 4th Avenue is kind of right over here, a little farther than that, but just to get you orientated. And Puget Sound Park, I can see, is, is right here. So at Hazel Valley Park, what we're looking at doing is putting a fence across the entire width of the park, to make about an acre and a half. Uh, the people would use the existing pathway. This front area of the park would all remain the same. People would use this pathway to get in and then we'd have a gated unleash, unleashing area right here and kind of a lobby. So you'd unleash your dog. If you went to the right, you could go into the small dog area. If you went to the left, you could go into the large dog area. And then outside of the unleashing area, there's additional surfacing with some other material other than just grass because that's going to take the, the brunt of the abuse with everybody hanging out there and all the dogs. We would also bring water into the site. Uh, the, there's a water meter existing right here off of 126. That would get us water to the site. So, so the drawback on this site is, is mainly probably the re residents on this side, uh, right up to their, this back fence here. And you know, we can potentially, if we're going to go down this road, it, you know, improve the fencing, put screening up, things like that. But that, that's definitely a concern we've heard. Uh, we have heard some concerns about um, uh, dog noises and that sort of thing, potentially. And I'll go through those a little bit more. But just to give it the general layout, it's an acre and a half, and we're looking at pretty much cutting the park in half right about there. 
Okay, so what we heard from the neighbors is that they're concerned about the impacts with the dogs, especially if they have a dog and they have one fence in between their dog and our dog park. There, there could be some back and forth going on there, and I understand that. Uh, they may not be able to use their gate for their backyard into the park. I, I heard that uh, when I was looking at the sign-up sheet. I, I, I didn't see anybody that I saw that conflict when I was looking at the residents on the site, so I'm not quite sure if someone at the meeting was particularly being impacted that way. There were a couple of gates, but they were outside of our proposed uh, fencing, so it wouldn't impact them. Uh, one person you know, said they work at night, sleep during the day, concerned about noise, and I, I hear that uh, can, potentially. However, my experience with dog parks is the dogs you know, may tend to bark as they're coming in, but once they get in there with the friends and they're off their leash, they, they don't bark nearly as much as you think they would, especially when they're on their leash. And, and that owner it lives right in this residence right here to the, the west side of the park. And, and what we did is the fence to the park is actually right here. So the dogs would be more down in this area and a little away from that resident there. Uh, the park trail is used now by a lot of neighbors to walk around, and they don't like the idea of me taking that away. And when we looked at the site originally, we, we understood that, but we knew Puget Sound Park had a real nice senior trail around it, just a, a residential lot away to the, to the east. Uh, I, I was asked, why don't I use Puget Sound Park? It's right around the corner. It's a lot bigger. you got a lot more space. And really my answer to that is, that, and why I didn't look at some of these other undeveloped larger parks was, uh, this park is pretty limited on what you can do with it. I can't put a normally baseball field here. I can't put a soccer field. There's not a whole lot of opportunity at this park. Uh, a park like Puget Sound is a park where we want to have a pretty long process, meet with neighbors, meet with residents, and master plan the park and decide what our bigger vision is for a park like that, rather than just kind of dropping something like this in. So that's why I didn't look at a park like a Puget Sound Park. That was kind of a good, clean sleep. Uh, and then why change this nice neighborhood park? You know, again, the reason we're proposing the change is just that we're hearing from residents that they'd like to have an opportunity to have a dog park. And, and this park appear to be underutilized from our perspective. Okay, we'll go to Salmon Creek. So Salmon Creek Park is just under five acres. It's a big rectangular park. And topography-wise, just so you understand the site, right along this wooded area is a hillside. So the park drops off significantly down this way. This is 118th Street on the south side, and this is 6th Avenue southwest up here. This is a private residential street that, that ends right here. Uh, so what we would do at this side, we'd come in at, from 118th, that's where we'd direct people for the main parking area, and we'd create a soft service pathway to get into the dog park. You'd come into the dog park, this would be an unleashing area, and this would be a lot like what we did at Hazel Valley. And then small dogs could go off to the right here, and then the large dogs could go in this direction, and we have a small and a large here as well. We'd get water to the site, and that's going to come from the street over here somewhere, and that'll be a little additional expense over Hazel Valley because we don't have a meter currently. And this area, it'd be more expensive, as I mentioned earlier, because we'd have to build this entire fence. We'd be brand new. There is no fence existing. So all this fence would be brand new. The pathway would have to be brand new and the water source would be brand new. So those are the bigger impacts on this site. So what we did, we stayed on this upper lawn area. This is all fairly level, and there's some real nice mature trees here that provide shades. And there's a little bit of topography over this end. It drops down a little bit over this area. But, it, but it's kind of interesting. And we're taking up about a half to a third, about a half of the upper lawn area, we're leaving quite a bit of lawn space here. Uh, the, the one other, the other concern, and I'll just go into what the neighbor said at this point. Uh, the one concern I'll skip to number two is 118th, where we assume all the parking would be, and that's where we would direct people to get to this park. Uh, does get used because of the right across the street of New Start High School, just to the south, or New Start School. There's a uh, little ball field there, and it gets programmed by Highline High School. And unfortunately, uh, Highline hasn't gone back. I'm trying to get a little better idea of how many times a year that's programmed out so where we might see those uh, traffic impacts. So that, that's a concern. 
A, a, a very big concern that I have that I'm hearing from the neighbors is over here, Sixth Avenue Southwest, which is a private street. It's on the, the east side of the park, and it dead ends here. Uh, without anything being at this park, they, they do already have some concerns and impacts with people that come in like from 116th up north and coming to the park and, and try to park on the street or if they can't park, try to turn around. It's a real narrow private street. So that, that's definitely a concern. And, and if we went forward with this one, we'd want to be like a way of public works and look at signage or landscape elements or something new to try to keep folks out of there. But, but we would always direct people that the parking's on 118th and I'm coming from the south side. Uh, the, oh, there was one other complaint off of here, 118th and 8th. There's, a, uh, there, there's an uncontrolled intersection here, and one of the neighbors, or a couple of neighbors, mentioned that they get some pretty uh, near is at this intersection already due to the, the hill coming up 118th there at 8th Avenue. And we thought maybe with the additional traffic, we might warn a stop sign. So that, that might be something we'd want to look at. Uh, probably the last thing be, again is you know why why change this nice neighborhood park and and uh, you know, the answer I, you know I'm giving is the same I'll pretty much give on Hazel Valley is it, it seemed unutilized it has a lot of space I, I, I won't be taking the entire park again this is about a, about an acre and a half it, it, it is nice I mean if I was a neighbor right across the street it's sure nice you know not having a whole lot of activity in there this this would definitely increase that a little bit for sure um, but. So that's what we heard from the neighbors. Some pretty good, you know, some the general concerns these neighbors had at the like Sunday Creek. So my next steps are is uh, get your feedback. You need more additional feedback from the folks here tonight if they have a chance to, to talk. Uh, evaluate if there's any other potential locations and what the real community support for moving forward with this project is. Uh, my next public meeting, well, I'll have a revised presentation, it will be uh, May 8th at a Parks and Rec uh, <coughs> board meeting at the same location at their St. Bernadette's. And then I'll, after that, I'll develop a final program proposal to bring back to council with a recommendation from myself in June. And that was it. Thank you very much, Mr. Orman. And so, um, as I mentioned at the start, this is a study session format, so ideally we'd like to have as, an op as open of a discussion as possible. So if anyone uh, here would like to comment, um, just as we're discussing it, um, ideally come up to the microphone there so everyone who's watching uh, at home can hear your comments. And I'll just try to take people in order, uh, council members and members of the public, and for any questions or comments on the issue at hand. So I'll start off, uh, we've got a couple of council members here, so I'll start off with Council Member Rawson. Thank you. <clears throat> I had a, uh, a couple of questions. The, the, the first one I had, I was a little disappointed that both of the parks are in the far north end of the city, and they're only half a mile apart. Uh, and I was wondering why, in particular, Lakeview Park wasn't on our list. Was that looked at? Yeah, it was. I, the reason I didn't go forward with Lakeview, I mean, something we could definitely you know, look into further is because we don't own the property. It, it's Highland School District property. We have a 40-year lease for the bottom half of the park, so I'd have to, we'd have to enter into a, a long-term lease for the upper half if we're going to develop it. Uh, I know recently they were trying to even sell that piece of the property for development, so I'm not sure what their plans are with that. I don't know how short or long term it might be, but it's, it's certainly something that has potential. That upper area would be about an acre, maybe a little bit more than an acre if we cleaned it up in order to develop that. Well, I, I looked at it, it looked like a great spot for an off-leash park, and, uh, and probably 40 years would exceed the life of any improvements we would do as part of an off-leash area. Yeah, yeah, if that's something, you know, council wants me to talk to uh, Highland School District and see if uh, they'd be interested in that. I just wasn't, what I was looking for was something under our control more than trying to guess what they're going to do a couple years down the road. But it, it's definitely a site, you know, potentially worth looking at. Well, and I was, I, I was trying to do a little research on my own, and I was trying to figure out how far people, I was wondering, do you have any information on how far people are willing to, to go to get to the off-leash park? Uh, just based on experience, uh, it really depends on the size of the park, you know, destination park, like a Marymore Park, it's a regional 
people will come from you know easily over 10 miles away something that's an acre and a half and i've got the parks up the white side like another half a mile from salmon creek that's i think eight acres up there we got grandview park uh, personally i would think it pretty much just draw from the near you know, like a five you know five mile radius about yeah, was, well the reason i was asking i was thinking it'd be better to have you know one on each end of the city rather than just one in the north end the uh but I, I went out and I walked through both parks and I was on Saturday when the sun was out and I was surprised that there was, I saw one family at Hazel Valley and they said they had never seen anybody else there except people walking their dogs. And one fellow walking his dog through Salmon Creek and that was it. But I also wanted, I wanted to put in a word for the kids at Newstart. I believe they're the ones that cleaned up all the brush at Salmon Creek, right? Yeah, right. They did a beautiful job. They, they do, and that's why you notice I didn't touch their area, because <laughs> we've been working with them. That's why I didn't go down those hillsides at all, because they pulled out a ton of, of blackberries over the last four years and put in a lot of plantings. Originally, I was looking at going down that hill from that upper lawn area, and I decided not to, because I, I destroyed what they've been working on. That's a really nice park there, Bill. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so my comments, and the other thing I had was the comment about the fencing. I looked at the fence there at Hazel Valley, and frankly, I wouldn't trust that as a fence for an off-leash area. It, there's nothing to keep dogs from digging under it. There are sections of it that are down or missing on the south end of the park and along the southwest side of the park. And I was, that's another one. I couldn't find a standard. I tried looking for what's the standard for fencing off-leash areas, and I couldn't find any. But is there a standard for that? Yeah, most of them are four feet. Most of them are four feet. The dogs, I mean, some dogs <coughs> on a rare occasion will jump them, but most of them don't because all their friends are inside. Well, that's only a three foot fence there now. So to do it properly, we'd be doing a holding fence there anyway. I uh -huh, most of it, yeah. yeah. For sure, the south would be east side. The west side looks a little more intact. Well, actually, I thought the west yeah, side was the four states. East side, yeah. yeah. But I just, you know, my concern with that is if we were going to depend on that fence that's there, my concern would be liability if a dog either went over the fence or under the fence and either got injured or injured somebody outside the park. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't bring any cost estimates today because that's a further evaluation that, you know, I want to look at because that's what a neighbor concern actually, potentially dogs getting through under fences or mixing. So we would really have to do a thorough evaluation every foot of that fence. So. And then I can have a final cost system before we do compare apples to apples. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to see something, I don't know other people on the council, but I'd like to see them that included a park in the south end of the city. And and uh, in between the two, you've got picked out for the north end. Uh, my preference would be Salmon Creek Park. Deputy Mayor Victoria? Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, Councilman Member Robinson mentioned liability uh, if a dog jumps over the fence and hurts itself or hurts someone else. Um, do we have to do we need special liability for dog parts? What kind of insurance coverage? No, it's never, never been a concern. I came from a, a very large city when I came here, and, and no, there, there is nothing. And Craig, my builder, yeah. talked to that. I don't know. Because in our that, in our report but, further in the packet, it mentions um, liability um, for animal control if an aggressive dog bites somebody. So, uh, just wondering what kind of liability for dog parts. The <clears throat> excuse me, the insurance pool that we belong to, WCIA. I'm sure has other cities in their membership that have off-leash dog parks, but I'm also sure that they would want to make sure that <clears throat> the standards that do apply to the fencing and those kind of things are being <clears throat> addressed. But uh, we would want to alert or notify WCAA before we added this to our park system and make sure that they were okay with it. So in this they, process could be that could that be one of the steps that we're vetting? Sounds like it'll be one for sure now. Okay, thanks. Two, yeah, two can other I add things. a comment on that? Because I, I looked into that 
that the only liability I found was arose where there was negligence in the maintenance of the fencing around the park and dogs actually got out of the off-leash area and then either got injured or injured somebody else or an animal outside the off-leash area. That does make sense to me. Liability that would occur or injuries that would occur within the park generally I think would be subject to the recreation immunity statute of the state which says that if you're hurt within a park or, uh, engage in an activity that you don't pay for that the city is immune from liability for that. Um, the other two things I noticed so Steve I'm going to ask you to help me out on the Salmon Creek Park um, you mentioned there's one residence that abuts the park, but I noticed that there's like five or six. Yeah, so, what I was referring to on the, on the screen it is directly abutting the park, like the same situation Hazel Valley is. There's just this one neighbor to the north, kind of on the northwest corner, right there. Right now there's no fence in between the park and that person's house at all. Uh, so but how about these other four here? Their properties. Oh, but I'm not going down there. Okay, got it. Thank yeah, so my, okay. my fence line stays up on the hill. Okay. You know, right what about the lot right next to that house? Is that the, the, the vacant lot right next This one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's vacant right now. That's how we can develop it. It potentially, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, I, would, I would like to see us looking at a couple more sites and seeing if there are are less impacts on residential houses. Um, and Jerry, I would agree that Lakeview actually is a, a great park because it, um, I think there's only one side of the park and right now that's all vacant land. So there's, there might be one residence um, that would be impacted, but there's streets surrounding the whole park. Um, so then my third uh, question, concern is that um, we have an unleashed area and a leashed area of the parks. To bring the dog into both of these parks, I have to go through a leashed area of the park. Correct. So yeah. I, uh, I have two dogs, and I take my dogs to off-leash parks and on-leash parks. And um, it's very common at off-leash parks for people to open their car door and just let their dogs go. Um, not following the rules that are established at that park. So how are we going to enforce that and, and protect that neighborhood from a higher increase of off-leash dogs, not in the dog park, but in the surrounding area? Uh, boy, that's, like you said, it's a tough one because that happens pretty much everywhere you're at. Uh, this one, at least I have the advantage you know, currently of having a very organized volunteer, the, the Beton Dog Group. A, a big part of this is going to be volunteer built, volunteer sponsored. Uh, I, I, I at least have a lot of folks that are involved in the community that can help me with the public education up front, uh, making sure the ground rules are as clear as possible. You know, the reality of it is if we don't get them in the beginning and set the rules and, and do it by peer pressure, just like a lot of the dog activities inside of a dog park, uh, it's almost an unenforceable, an impossible situation to, to keep somebody from breaking the rules. We can't be out there with animal control police we need to watch something like that. So I would encourage us to pick a location that maybe has less impact on neighborhoods. And is there anything in um, the Northeast Redevelopment Area or South? So I'm looking forward to hearing more information. Thank you. Councilmember Block. Mr. Romer, I want to thank you for uh, the time and effort that you've put into this and uh, also again recognize LA Studios for their efforts. Uh, that was fantastic for them to step up and volunteer to uh, build this. Um, my hope is that uh, this will be an all-volunteer effort and, and that it will be constructed with uh, uh, contributions. Um, I think there's enough interest in this community that uh, we uh, We'll be ready to step up. I want to point out we have uh, three uh, uh, pet stores, uh, a feed store, uh, several animal uh, uh, food pantries, 
uh, natural animal food pantry. Uh, this is a community that's definitely uh, interested in their pets and uh, having fun with them. Um, my concern is, is uh, um, right now we have two dog parks in, in the area, West Crest and Grandview. West Crest is uh, just on the other side of uh, Roxbury, about a half mile north of Roxbury. And Grandview is down uh, at uh, just off of I-5, um, almost in Midway. Um, so there is some distance for people to go. My concern with uh, Salmon Creek Park is the proximity to uh, uh, Puget Sound Park. I mean, excuse me, um, no, 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 West Crest Park. And, uh, um, you know, having two, two dog parks that close to each other, is that really serving, serving our, uh, our citizens? And uh, of, the, uh, of the two, uh, <coughs> my preference would be for Hazel Valley. The situation is, is that when we um, annexed North Berrien, uh, we inherited several parks that were undeveloped and underused. And like Councilmember Robinson, I've been through those facilities several times. And apart from occasionally seeing somebody uh, walking their dog there, ironically, um, basically uh, the park isn't used very much. I talked to one resident, and he said somebody comes by and once a day sits on one of the benches and, and thinks. And uh, kids come by and do what we used to do when we were teenagers every once in a while. So that's the only activity that he sees in the at, uh, Hazel Valley. Um, so my uh, my thought is that Hazel Valley is the most developed of the of the two parks, and um, as such, uh, with the proximity of the water meter, the pathway already in, I think that would be the uh, best course for us to follow. My concern with Lakeview is again. As you expressed, uh, we don't own that, so there would be uh, uh, problems possibly with the school district. Um, and also, as I understand it, um, Berry and Bearcats use that, that site now to practice on. Uh, I seem to recall something mentioned about that. So um, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, take away that use from uh, the Bearcats. I know they've come to us before and asked for. Uh, for a site, and they were able to work this out with the school district. So, anyway, uh, I have a concern about uh, taking away that opportunity from them. Yeah, yeah, I know I want to mention that. But Bearcats, if they do use it, they use it in the lower part, the grass area. Yeah. This, this is the upper part. Um, so, the, there's that, it goes to the real steep hill to get to the lower grass area. Yeah. So, the, the, the upper part, I think, as well. There'd be some significant demolition costs taking up foundations with this school and development costs. So that that would be something else to look at. So Councilmember McGill. I share <coughs> Councilmember Block's concerns about Lakeview Park. Mm -hmm. I'm pleased that for both of the parks you brought to us that you're developing a plan to get community input. I think that's going to make the difference between a successful dog park and one of the problems. So I'm really happy about that. The other comment that Councilmember Robeson made is we need a park in the South End. I think the Parks Department has been working on parks in the South End for as long as I've been in the city of Burien. So it's been a high priority. We continue to look for land that's available. The one piece that we had essentially went away, and I can't remember why. Councilmember Clark will remember why that didn't work out. It was rhododendron gardens. But a concentrated effort to find a south in park would certainly be appreciated by this council. My concerns that Councilmember Block didn't mention is the area in the lower park is used by kids a lot. It's also the park of choice for preschool kids. 
Not that a dog would ever get loose and harm a kid. It could be a scary event. So I'm concerned about the compatibility of the dog use park with the existing use of the park. I'm also concerned that it's next to 160th, which is an extremely busy street with no parking. So the only parking would be on the western side, and my recollection is that is a busy neighborhood, and I think probably has six houses across the street from the park itself. And I also am concerned that... Councilmember McKillop, point out, I have a question you're referring to Lakeview Park. Lakeview Park. Okay, thank you. And I think it might be 8th or 10th, there's houses all
we all got together and we looked at parks and came up with the two that you see before you. Now personally, I said, gee, I looked at every park in the city where we could put a park, a dog park. Now that's a little misnomer because I didn't even consider Triangle Park. Now, that one I just, you know, over, I neglected looking at it, I'll say that. My criteria was a park that the city controlled, the park department controlled, that we were not disrupting an existing program of the park, which sort of when I was looking at Mosher, there was no way to fit it in there. We had comments at the meeting about why not Lake Burien Park. And that I, I obviously dismissed because we have concerts in the park there, we have late night movie in the park there, we have practices there. Arbor Lake was high on my list. With the big grassy area at the north end. But parking was an issue at Arbor Lake. I got down to supporting Hazel Valley because there was parking close by at Puget Sound Park. The program that would be disrupted at Hazel Valley existed a block away and it was a walking program. If you're there to walk, you can walk a block, was my thought. Uh, Southern, Southern Heights we considered, but again, we don't fully own that. There was some interesting challenges there I would love to have presented, but again, it wouldn't work. So that's just where we were looking at things. Salmon Creek and Hazel Valley really were the two that came to mind. Lakeview has some interesting potential, but the school district I know is always a challenge. And the expense. We have a group of people, and you saw a lot of them here with their dogs, who are committed to raise the money to build it. If we get into where they also have to raise the money to demolish a lot of things, you're going to be talking city money. And we're tight on city money. So that sort of was my thought process. I'm not speaking for the board. That was just sort of where I was coming from. Thank you. Well, Mr. Basie, quick question. Did you consider a NERA at all? No, I didn't. Uh, that's a commercial area. Uh, the Parks Department really doesn't consider, control it. It's a uh, port of Seattle and this city, economic development, and I was kind of going, I didn't even think of it, but in my mind I'm going, port of Seattle for permission? Okay. Uh, they haven't always been the most cooperative agency with the city, though I know Rose will disagree with me on that. She loves them. And if I could make sure. one comment, just sure. you brought up here a couple of times now. I have had some initial discussions with uh, Maya regarding the NERA site. And I know with the park development and the trail use, there's already a lot of concern uh, from the port's perspective, well, especially from the FAA's perspective, as far as bringing in uh, uses that bring a lot of folks into uh, a nice uh, particular area within the flight zone. Uh, her, her initial reaction when I mentioned the dog park was the dogs would be great, just not the people. And that's kind of the FAA's uh, feelings about that. So it, it's definitely something I could ask a little further, but the initial reaction is uh, they, they really don't want us to bring in a whole lot of high use impacts into an area like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Good Space Guy, and when I re read the uh, proposal for the unleashed dog park, these two, two locations, I thought, well, uh, two is better than one because uh, 
to decrease the uh, use at each park that would affect the neighbors. Uh, so I thought, well, more than one is better to uh, diffuse the use throughout Burien. But it seemed to me a, a, a long distance for the people from the south of Burien to go all the way to the north. So I also thought that a more uh, a central location uh, would be desirable. Uh, in regards to these two uh, locations, uh, the south of the two that we're discussing today is called Hazel Valley, on, uh, where access is on 126th Street. Uh, and it shows that, uh, that it looks like there's limited parking there. Uh, I have experience in Bellevue, uh, north of the uh, Bellevue uh, Central Library, or Regional Library. There's a park about two or three blocks uh, north of the Bellevue Library uh, that is sort of centrally located in neighborhood. The uh, park is surrounded by private residences. And uh, to solve the limited parking at that location, what Bellevue did is they made the parking perpendicular on the street. So you just drive, drive down the street, take a right turn into your parking space, and so that uh, by having perpendicular parking, it greatly increased the parking at that small neighborhood park, and it seems to have solved the pro parking problem. So. The Hazel Valley Park location seems ideal for perpendicular parking uh, to solve the parking problem. Now, the Salmon Creek location, which is the uh, northern of the two locations under discussion this evening, it appears that uh, that uh, Salmon Creek location has a lot more parking on 116th Street. and. Uh, but it's been mentioned that there's sports facility uh, across the street that uh, sometimes takes up the parking. So again, if one established uh, perpendicular parking at the uh, Salmon Creek location, that would not only provide more than adequate parking for the park users, but it would also provide additional parking for the sports users. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. I'm Rob Johnson. I live in Miriam for gosh, I think 15 years in town or longer. I think we need to do a dog park, and I really do like the Hazel Valley Park because there is adequate parking. And like Steve was saying, I, I'm a constant user of West Crest, and it's about the same distance to walk from the parking lot to the small dog park. And as far as dog noise goes, my dogs only make a few barks. And then they get in, they play with their dog, their friends, and that's it. But there's also the economic issue, and that's when I go to West Crest, I usually stop at Dubsy Coffee and get a coffee and a human treat. And if I'm going there, I'm not going to come back here in frequent Deering Press or Starbucks or some other retail here. So you, you can chew on that for a while, but you know, I just really think that I've been to the, both locations and I was really impressed with the thought of Hazel Valley as a dog park. Yeah, that's my two cents. Thank you. I'm Ray Helms. I, uh, as a City of Burien resident, um, I'm supporting the dog park as well, um, and I support the Hazel Valley. And mostly the reason why is for financial. As a Burien resident, I want to spend as little money as possible for a project like this. Um, the city has already budgeted funds annually to support the Grandview Park with materials and labor, so we have already money there for maintenance that we could use. The city already has funds allocated in the budget to actually maintain this current park as it is. So that's not going to take away. 
Um, if we designate a park like Hazel Valley that already has existing water supply, you don't have to worry about running water lines or putting in a new meter. Um, if you designate this group that's working to um, be part of this nonprofit, then you can help them. Um, if you designate them to raise the funds for the materials and the labor that it's going to take for this park to be established. Um, if you direct staff to create a punch list for goals and timelines for this group to meet, they would be welcome to that. Create a long-term agreement with this group in the city for continued maintenance after the park has been established. This is a low-cost project. All we have to do is designate a park for this group to sink their teeth in and to raise funds to create. That's all. Thank you. Kelly Dawson. Um, I've been living here for about 40 years all my life. So uh, I got a dog recently, and the dog likes to run, and my backyard just isn't big enough. And so I got thinking about that, and there's a lot of apartments in the city, a lot of condos, and their dogs don't have anywhere to go run. So that's maybe one consideration you can think of. I like the Hazel Valley uh, site as well for a lot of reasons. And I don't know, just choose a park for us and we'll get to work and we'll make it great for you guys. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further comments on this oh, one, then. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I've been interviewing for 16 years and I am, I just wanted to say, I'm happy to see the commitment, the time you are taking to. To look into this, I expected it to be a done deal and nobody was looking at anything. I'm, I see that all the council members have looked into it and I appreciate that. I live by Salmon Creek Park and I'm against having to park there. We have the baseball in the summer, the kids, we already have a problem with the parking there. They come with not only the kids themselves but the families to watch them. The parking is horrendous. You can hardly get through. They don't park correctly. I mean, who does? And we live on right around the corner, and 118th continues. It's a private street. They can't park there. So they come around to 6th Place Southwest, which is a pretty narrow street, and park. And then we're stuck getting in and out. It's difficult. It's not good, and also we have two little dogs. Most of the neighbors want to have small dogs, small pets. I've talked to them, they don't want the big dogs there. My dog has already been attacked by a pit bull on hundred on 6th, <coughs> yeah, extension there, the private road there. I really don't want any more big dogs coming and running around there. It's, I just hope Hazel gets a big <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got a few more topics tonight, and so we'll move on then to our next discussion item, which is a review of CARES operational evaluation. Thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Powerful presentation that will 
take care also through the highlights of the report. To begin, staff will talk a bit about the background of service provided by CARES to the city of Erion. Uh, just last Friday, uh, staff received service statistics from the Regional Animal Services of King County or RAS that uh, staff will include in the PowerPoint that council doesn't find in the package. Um, staff will then talk about the finding of the reports and talk about the improvement recommendation made by Denise McVicker. Uh, Ms. Deborah George, Executive Director of CARES, is in attendance tonight if council has any questions for her. Um, a background um, of how we come about today is in June 2011, City of Union and CARES signed a contract for a three years service uh, from June of 2011 to through May of 2014. Um, another highlight I would like to point out is that the cost saving as estimated by, uh, by RAS in June of 2012 is come out to be about $341,000 plus RAS going to keep the licensing fee. And the current contract that we have with CARE is $120,000, and the City of Union will keep the licensing fee. So the cost saving to the City by contracting with CARE is about $360,000 <coughs> per year. Um, Can I get to pause here again? Uh, that's one thing I wanted to point out to Council. Uh, previously, when we talked to you about the cost of the contract, what we didn't do was uh, subtract out the, or take into account the, uh, the licensing fees that we get. As Neil just said, the city receives between sixty and seventy thousand dollars in licensing fees that remains with the city that we apply to the cost of the CARES contract. So uh, the net out of general fund cost of this uh, service, the CARES service, is about sixty thousand dollars a year. Um, the when when we uh, if, if when, when a city contracts with RASP, which is the King County Animal Control, uh, King County keeps the license fees, so that would be sixty to $70,000 in addition to the contract cost. And that's where uh, Jan came uh, with the, uh, the total that you see in bullet point three, the $360,000 per year in additional cost if we uh, go with King County. So I just want to make that very clear. And uh, we, as Jan said, we Fresh these um, stats, so a uh, significant annual savings through this contract. Um, in number four, um, we, in 2011, there is uh, some statistic about the number of calls received by RAS and by CARE. Uh, this is an important piece of statistic because um, King County used the number of calls and the population number in each city when they estimate how much they, it would cost. Uh, that city to join into the regional animal services of King County. Um, and, but to talk about services, uh, so the way King County do is that they divide their, the King County into s several regions, and the region in, that, in this area, they have uh, two uh, animal control officers that serve six cities and uh, an incorporated area. In our city, we have one dedicated animal control officer for, for our city. Uh, this is the new information that I have just received last Friday. Um, so in this uh, in this slide, you will find the information about uh, the cost of service um, that I mentioned earlier. But just some number to compare is the number of service calls, as you can see that. Uh, the city population is about 5% of King County, but uh, the, you know, the, the population that they, they serve by, by RAS, but the number of calls we receive here is about 53%. It's, um, it's a phenomenal high number. In terms of pet return to owners, we return about 28% back to owner versus RAS, about 16%. Uh, this, uh, the, the number that we return to owner versus the number that we take in as an animal intake number and the uh, utilization rate in the bottom. So I'd like to pause on this as well. Uh, so uh, we just got this information and we'd like to agree to you again in a, in a slightly different format. Um, interesting, uh, if you look at the service
service calls in the center of the call there. You'll see that our, our city generates about half the number of calls as the, in the service area that includes more than a million people. Uh, our residents demand a lot of their uh, animal control service. Um, adopted out, 51% of the CARES animals are adopted out as compared to 53%, so basically the same. And we'll bring those stats back to you in a better format next time around. Return to owners, 28% compared to the county, 16%. And then the euthanasia rate, 9% compared to the 13.6. Uh, the raw data speaks very well for this service. Uh, a little bit about the um, experience and expertise that uh, Denise McVicker has on this area of animal care and control. She has been working for the Humane Society since 1977 and currently is the Deputy Director of the organization. So, um, the main, the, in, the, in the report that she submitted to us, uh, there, at the end, there are conclusions as well as in the, at the front page of the report, she also mentioning uh, some of her observations and conclusions as well. Overall, she stated that care uh, meets the public need. Uh, the public safety needs in terms of animal control and fulfilling the contract obligation with the city and uh, staff is listing number one through six. What are some of these obligations that we have in our contract with care that they are fulfilling? Yeah, I'm sorry to keep interrupting down here, but let's put this together and done a great job. Uh, we asked uh, Denise to focus in two main areas. Uh, uh, we want to know uh, first of all, that they, the CARES was performing the contract, and that's what this slide gets to there. Uh, they are, in fact, performing all aspects of the contract and doing that very well. The second area has to do with the next slide down has, I think. Um, Denise McVicker also concluded that the animals um, under their care are being treated humanely. Yeah, meets the five freedom of animal care. And, and this was an area that um, I asked them to highlight because um, council mentioned this several times when we embarked on this uh, uh, project, that it was a, a very important to council no matter what we did, they wanted to know that the animals were being treated humanely. And this is the criteria, this is the industry standard for determining whether animals are in fact being treated humanely. Yeah. And uh, Denise very explicitly in her uh, report, said that the animals are needing these five freedoms. So in summary, human care meets the contractual obligation with the city, and they are treating the animals humanely. Um, as with any young organization, uh, there are always rooms for improvement, and um, I am putting together two slides for this. One is to talk about the easy fixes that uh, staff, or that uh, we really care staff can do right away just to, uh, to, to make the immediate effect. And one through five are some of the examples. There are more. So, Nyan uh, didn't try to list everything that was in this um, very well written and detailed document. Um, there, there were things that could be easily fixed, and I believe are, are starting to be fixed as we speak, and this is kind of the order of magnitude of those things that uh, he identified. Right. For example, number three, I mean, uh, Denise McVicker was saying staff were just being over -cautious. They don't have to remove the cats whenever they clean out the cages. You can just do spot cleaning and stuff like that. Doing so with stretching out a cat and maybe making them ill and whatnot. So, um, kind of the best practice, kind of advice, kind of thing for all the stuff. Does everybody see Murphy there? Yeah. Uh, 
some of the fixes that would take additional time or and funding. And um, so they are listed one through six there. So these are uh, like take item number one. I asked you know the specific to make sure this one's included. Uh, we've seen uh, activity on the blog, for example, where uh, the residents became very upset with a dead end by the side of the road that carriage didn't pick up. Uh, the rest of the story is that CARES is not contract contractually required to pick it up. Uh, the Public Works Department is, and they do that when they can get to it. Uh, so this was the, the sort of thing that um, Denise looked at and said, hey, you know, uh, in the spirit of uh, providing sort of services people normally expect, this would be one of them. And this is something that the city ought to consider uh, uh, contracting with CARES to do. Then item number two, uh, the training. Uh, when Ray became the ACO, he immediately got the uh, kind of requisite training to do this. There's a, another training facility in our city. Is it? It's in uh, the Is training it? center. Well, criminal Justice Center. Yeah, the Criminal Justice Center uh, that, that does um, a statewide accreditation for this, and we could not get access for Ray. We couldn't do it, and we tried. Uh, and Denise, on our behalf, uh, called and made those arrangements so uh, Ray's going to be now able to have that sort of access. So um, from the beginning we've run into those sorts of uh, issues that are being solved as we go along and uh, we're very grateful for the uh, help she gives now. Uh, you'll see that, could you go back that down? Uh, all of the items here require money and they all make sense and these are things that uh, and he said, you know, you don't have to do this. Um, and chances are we'll never improve uh, Ray's physical appearance because he always dresses that way. But uh, the fact is, is that we could uh, tweak a few things and not a, a great amount of money and uh, really up the level of service of this uh, upstart. The next step, uh, is uh, for staff to discuss the review more in depth with uh, with CARES and with uh, Denise Mofrika, then staff can return to council in April with specific recommendations on how to uh, to implement Denise Mofrika finding, and this could include uh, ongoing evaluation, additional funding, or some kind of modification to the contract, such as pick up the uh, dead animal in the road public spaces. There's a little, there are a couple other things here I wanted to mention. You can look at, could you go back to that slide that you have from your ask the numbers that you just have? The, the amount of savings being created here is phenomenal. It's, it's way out of proportion uh, to the actual contract cost. And we'll, give, we'll uh, put these in a little better context for you. But if you look at the things that you asked about in the past, for example, the euthanasia rate, lower than the counties. Return to owner's rate, about the same. Um, adopted out likewise. Um, the calls for service, look at that. You know, 2,860 2, as opposed to 5,400 countywide. So uh, clearly, this organization is doing a, a, just a phenomenal job. And I think that needs to be pointed out and, and stated clearly. Another little item uh, that came up in this report that I didn't know about, and I'll state here because uh, probably nobody else has said it. Uh, the report, or Denise discovered that Deborah George has all this time been working for free without any sort of compensation. And um, that's very laudable. I don't think I would have done it under these circumstances. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, considering the service that this agency has provided for this community, I think we owe her a, a large debt of, of thanks or a debt of gratitude. Um, Yon mentioned that we'll come back to you in April. Uh, don't be surprised if I come back to you and say we want to implement some of the improvements that Denise has talked about and we want to, uh, we, we want to add to their contract to do it. Um, I'm just telling you, Council, it's, we're in this, what, two, two years now. Um, this is a classic um, young community-based organization that is just doing everything right. Uh, lots of room for improvements, lots of rooms, but they're clearly passionate about this work. They're providing it uh, very inexpensively, far less so than if it were in the 
public sector, and I think it's time we got behind it. Were they not doing this work, the hit to the general fund would be enormous. I want to remind council that we pay $220,000 for direct human services. The cost of the county contract for taking care of animals in this town would be not quite double, but beginning to approach that. So I just, I, I want to tell you what it's likely I'm going to advocate for because uh, they've been through some very rough times. Um, they've done it in good cheer and they're improving every day and I'm, I'm no problem. And I, I think it's time that we uh, supported them with and made sure that they were going to be here for a very long time because I hope they will. Okay. So that's the thing to do at the end of the Staff is ready to take one council comments and questions. Okay, thank you very much. Any comments or questions? There's uh, council or public. Council Member Robson. Well, I wanted to comment. I like all the uh, suggestions. There's a, a lot of small suggestions in there for tightening up procedures, and I hope that CARES is going to be pursuing those. And I thought from the beginning that 120,000 a year was a ridiculous number to try and get. Uh, and an actual animal control function for, and that the city was underfunding that. And I hope that we'll get some numbers that we can use so we can provide adequate funding for that and to uh, make the changes that have been recommended. Deputy Mayor Kokoda. Thank you. Uh, I thank my fellow council members for this audit. Um, I would like to, um, it, it looks like we're going to have to increase funding for animal control to, to um, try to meet some of these recommendations from the evaluation. In doing so, I'd like to reconsider uh, King County Animal Control, um, and I think the, the background numbers that we see on the overhead, um, statistically it's challenging to compare the euthanasia rate uh, it sounds like cares does not do a behavior assessment so we're actually adopting uh, possibly aggressive dogs out right now in king county um, that's probably attributing to some of their higher euthanasia rates so um, i think that it behooves us to consider um, king county along with cares when we're reevaluating the contract and with the numbers that were being provided, um, I'm hearing that CTAC has an arrangement with County, King County that's different than the numbers that were being provided. So I'd love to have a representative from King County come in front of the council and share what, what they're able to provide us. Thank you. Council Member I don't think that it's stressed often enough that this is a discretionary service. The city of Burien does not have to provide this service to the community. We've taken on this discussion very thoughtfully and carefully. We tried to put together a program and a plan. The first uh, contractor didn't realize the intent and the amount of resources that needed to be put in the program. I'm very happy with what CARES is doing. I think it's cost effective. I applaud Deborah for doing this for free. I think she's done a remarkable job. The one concern I have is there has been ongoing discussion, especially in the B-Town blog, that's been extremely negative about CARES and about city services. I think that the blog is being used as a venue to look at certain commenters' understanding of government services, and a few people are trying to influence some very carefully thought out decisions. I continue to have uh, a difference of opinion with my fellow council member, Kokovia, when I look at the numbers in front of me, the service calls, the service costs, the population served, I just don't think that King County Animal Shelter is going to give us near the service that we have now with a group of very dedicated staff. 
I agreed that in order to increase this program, there's going to have to be an increase in cost to cover the services that these folks are essentially doing for free. I really appreciate everything Mr. Helms is doing to support the 2,860 service calls that he's contributed to. The comments have been this center isn't open 24-7 on this particular contract. That's not one of the requirements. I also understand that CARES is providing services for cats, which is also not part of the contract. We were very careful as a council when we designed this that we didn't want to take on the cat population and problems, and I see that they have done it just because they think it's the right thing to do. So I'm hoping when we have this discussion in April that we can look at a contract amendment that will give CARES some flexibility and some financing so that they can address all of the uh, deficiencies that uh, Ms. McVickers has come up with. And in the interest of providing the service this community wants, and I can't say this community deserves because this is not something that is prescriptive. It's simply because the city of Burien thinks that this is the right thing to do. Thank you. Councilman Paul. When we originally uh, looked at this issue, uh, um, my concern was the excessive amount of money that uh, King County was asking to provide this service. So I'm glad that we looked at uh, alternatives. My preference would have been for a professional animal patrol officer, similar to what they have in Des Moines, which uh, ironically uh, is $120,000 a year. But the council is actually going a different direction. So anyway, um, I also want to want to laud uh, Ms. George and, and especially uh, Mr. Helms. Um, you know, it's been here between night and day, Mr. Helms, since you've uh, joined the cures, so thank you very much. Um, you're doing a tremendous job. Um, some of the things that were cited in here were uh, upping the level of professionalism, such as uniforms, such things like that. I think that's something that would be useful for for uh, carers to look at. It's so the one thing that they won't be able to do with the rates. It's not going to work. Yeah, well, you know, if they make me wear an orange vest when I'm at work, you know, if it's part of the job requirement, it's amazing. Amazing what uh, they do. Um, you know, one of the things that, that has been brought up is, is increased funding. And you know, my concern is, is uh, right now, um, we're not selling enough licenses to cover our, our costs. As Mr. Martin pointed out, we're at a, a 50 or 60 K. 60 to 70. 60 to $70,000 deficit. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned because, you know, there aren't enough outlets in Marion to, to buy a license. Besides City Hall, there's across the street a place for pets. And then in White Center, there's an outlet and in Norman Park there's an outlet. And I think that one thing that we need to look at is, is making the availability of uh, pet licenses a lot easier. Uh, this is an important part of our revenue stream and uh, I think that this program should be self-supporting. You know, there's, there's been talk about uh, the funding issues with CARES uh, one suggestion I'd like to make right now, our present program calls for a $2 fee to be paid to the vendor. I'd like to suggest that uh, that one-time fee be uh, raised to $5 to uh, increase the incentive to sell pet licenses. Also, uh, carriers may want to look at that as a uh, fundraising uh, opportunity. I talked about partnering with other uh, Nonprofits uh, use this as a fundraising opportunity. And also, we need to uh, do more to uh, reach out to the citizens. 
citizens shouldn't have to come to City Hall. We should be able to go out to them. So I'd like to see us expand uh, the uh, venues where uh, we sell pet licenses, such as uh, the uh, auto licensing center here in Burien, uh, some of the grocery stores, all the pet stores. Um, I, again, it, it's important. I feel that this program be self-supporting and anything we do to increase revenue above that uh, is more money for uh, supporting our animal control program. Thank you. That's my part. Thank you. I too would like to thank Ms. George and Mr. Helms and the rest of the staff and volunteers for the work they have done. I uh, have visited over there and uh, I have been very impressed with, uh, with their uh, facility uh, and with their service. When we started in uh, with the discussion about what to do about animal control, we had no real idea of what it was going to take because we uh, have just contracted with King County. And we're to the point now where we realize that we have a good, um, a good service uh, model uh, and I, I do feel that we need to add, um, add funding to that. Um, I, am, I am very proud that Marion took a step away from King County, decided to go with the local nonprofit. I realized the nonprofit was being formed as they were doing the work. It takes a long time to get a nonprofit formed. I spent over a year. Uh, with a couple of other people forming a different nonprofit. So I know that that does not happen overnight. But while they were doing all of that work, they were also serving the city. And um, uh, I was always very impressed by that. I have looked at the blog, and it seems to me that the folks that have written negatively to CARES on the blog probably haven't been there, haven't uh, looked at the facilities, have not really spent time uh, understanding our contract and what we expected of peers. And so um, uh, for a long time, I have not paid attention to their comments because of that. I feel that comments need to be made with knowledge and not with just bashing because somebody wants um, uh, a certain thing done. Uh, so through all of that, through the number of times that Ms. George has been uh, unfairly treated, she has continued to provide, uh, I think, a, a, a good level of service to our community. And again, when uh, staff brings back their proposals for the uh, improvements that might be needed, I expect those improvements to come with uh, a dollar. Thank you. So we've heard uh, a round of comments from council. I just want to make sure that uh, any anyone wants to comment, they have the opportunity to do so. Otherwise, we'll move on. Um, it's been scouted. Do you want to comment? You need to be more decisive than that. You're yes. looking a little wishy-washy. Yeah. Mayor, I don't well look. But space guys can be recorded. Can I get consensus from the council on the question of whether we're going to pursue anything with King County? Because if we're not, I just assume not um, bring them back. The proposals that I've been focusing on have to do with enhancing and continuing on the CARES, not the opposite. And I just don't want to waste so much time by the perception of the we're doing something different. They want to want to mail us an offer. That, that's fine. But other than that, I'm going to hear from that. Okay, so I see. Uh, Also, we have the issue that the contract was up in 2014, so there would be no option for a committed bid. Okay. Um, so I think that uh, there was Trigovia and the company director was interested in hearing from the town as well as from the other. I'm sorry? Can I come to the other? I think that's the one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that now. Okay, so. Uh, Uh, my name is Good Space Guy, and as I was reading in the package and hearing the testimony, I thought, well, um, the City Council is uh, making it easier on the taxpayers by 
uh, contracting this service out to a, a private organization, uh, which is good. So I like it when, uh, when the burden on the taxpayer is, is de decreased. And I was surprised to hear that we have a training facility in Burien that refused to control, uh, uh, train our animal control officer, but I didn't understand why. Uh, and uh, so that was a question floating around in my, my mind. Why would the training facility in Burien refuse to uh, train our animal control officer? And now, and having just one animal control officer uh, seems inadequate uh, to me. And here we have so many people in Burien who are unemployed. Um, so it seems to me that uh, one can, uh, should be trying to hire some of the unemployed of Burien to assist in the animal control officer function. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember McGill. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, can I just make one comment? Sure. I certainly agree with Councilmember Block about fundraising opportunities, and I hope that CARES is considering that strongly. But one thing that I'd like to note to the audience that the professional animal control function in, Beer in Des Moines is through their police department. They are now facing something more than a $50,000 uh, lawsuit because one of, the one of the police officers who should be professionally trained for animal control shot Rosie. And it's been a very sad occurrence for Des Moines. I would hope that using professional animal control folks who carry guns is probably not the solution that Marion is looking for. Thank you, Ms. Mike. I'm a little concerned that Rose has made the comment that people that are writing on the blog don't have knowledge about what they're talking about. I posted a letter on the blog today. It has numerous items that were found to where CARES was deficient. Every one of those items came directly from Ms. McVicker's report. I didn't make any of it up. I also am concerned about the fact that it's only costing 60000 a year to run CARES, according to Mike Martin. I know Ray Helms has paid 45000 which leaves 15000 for all the vet visits, all of the lease payments on the property, and that all of the other salaries. That wouldn't work. No. no. So when you say 60000 is what we pay as a city, after the return of the pet license fee. That's correct. How, do you, how does that account for, like what I said, the 2500 a month for the property, the 45000 a year to pay rent, is training, the vet bills, yeah, the food? Explain. If you'd like, I'll explain that. OK. Um, so our contract with CARES is $120,000. Mm -hmm. That's our deal. So $10,000 a month we give to them. We get about sixty to seventy thousand dollars in revenue that we apply to that contract from the license fees. That's correct. Okay, so you said that leaves sixty thousand out of pocket, though. That's correct. That doesn't account for the forty-five thousand a year so, salary. So if you add the sixty thousand dollars that we get from license, from the sixty thousand we get from the general fund, you get one hundred and twenty, and that's what we pay to CARES. Right, but okay. So you get sixty thousand back. That's correct. Out of the hundred and twenty that you pay. You, so listen. You pay them ten thousand a month. Okay. So works out to hundred and twenty a year. Big numbers. So our deal with CARES is one hundred and twenty. They don't care whether we get a nickel in licensing fees. It's got nothing to do with that. Okay. So our our contract with them is we give them one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. The source of the one hundred and twenty thousand dollars from us is we get about $60,000 from licenses that people come in and buy, and then right. the general public pays $60,000 from the general fund. So 60 license plus 60 general fund is 120, and that's how we pay for the $120,000. Okay, I see what you're saying. I still think their expenses are a lot higher than 
what we're talking about though for and, and I think you know the right. salaries office staff have got visits the leasehold on the property all of the food and the salaries for Ray the salary and the training the van the maintenance the insurance and everything that you're saying works out to just ten thousand a month that's correct okay so they're not running in the red at all they're not they're at zero because I, I saw some big credit bills when I looked at the audit they're not running in the red and the audit didn't say they were running in the red well they had a thirteen thousand dollar credit card bill they're not running in the red and some other debts okay so um I just want to say I've visited the facility. I've seen what's going on in there. I've been there several times. So when I read the articles, I read what I see. I wrote what I saw from Ms. McVickers. And I, I think that people are writing from knowledge and concern about things going on with the Pet Center in Burien. And they're not making things up. And they're not trying to go after the council. They're just talking about things that matter to us. I have, I'm a pet owner. And I don't want my pet falling into some kind of a bad situation. You know, if it were to get loose and be taken in by care, so they're not going to label it. They are not going to properly describe it according to what Ms. McVickers said. They're not going to keep it necessarily away from other animals that might be sick. They're not going to uh, clean its area with proper chemical mixing. Uh, etc. So, I will agree with you that uh, there are some areas that they need to do things differently. That does not make them negligent or doing a bad job or putting animals in harm's way. I do have been an animal owner for over 40 years. My house has seldom ever been without an animal. And any time uh, that I would have needed I would, have, uh, I would have been perfectly comfortable with kids picking up an animal of mine and taking care of it until I got there or what have you. I have no reservation at all about the quality of the service that CARES is offering uh, in terms of taking care of the animals in their care. Okay. Well, I do know that they had concern about the quarantine area back when the health department was looking at it. It's been going on now for a year. It's still ongoing. It's still being a concern that's being so written some about. Of these things are concerns that they are going to that, that that are going to be addressed, but they are not fatal flaws to the extent that you shut them down. You give them the opportunity to fix the uh, few things that um, that were listed by Ms. McVicker. Okay, and then I also and noticed I want that to point out that Ms. McVicker has like a 25, 30 year history of working professionally, mm -hmm. and so she mm -hmm. knows where she speaks. Right. And she and I don't want to be baked further. We do have a council meeting. Okay. Okay, I did th think, though, it was a good idea for the council to reconsider a King County contract since CTAC got it for 110, which is even less than what we're talking about going to CARES. Is that true? No, is that correct? Um, I would like to be a little bit more technical in terms of how King County come up with different estimates for different cities. A long time ago, King County used the model of 50-50. 50 percent is based on population and 50 percent based on service call. And after a lot of outcry from cities of how come I get this kind of rate and how come the other city get this kind of rate, King County readjusted their model to be 80-20. 80 percent 80 is based on service call and 20 percent is based on the population number. So if you compare the city of SeaTac or Des Moines or Renton and whatnot to our city, they may have uh, less population or more population than us, but when King County look at the number of service call that they have to manage, I'm talking about service call only, not only not excluding follow-up or information call, that play into the factor of the number of four hundred three hundred and forty one thousand dollars dollar per year to provide service to our city. Does the uh, does the city of CTAC keep their licensing costs or does the county? I believe the county does. So how is the population different between CTAC and Burien? 
There's um, 33,000 in SeaTac. I think there? what John's saying is that the uh, calls for services yeah. is driving. Our calls for service are extraordinarily high. That's, cool. that's in part what drives the cost of the contract. Yeah, that's 80 percent of the determining factor of they want to use the estimated cost beside the number of population. Anyway, um, I'm just hoping the council reads Denise McVicker's report. Um, it was very interesting and it made me wonder about these numbers. Can I get a copy of this slide? Is that possible? The, just the, yeah, well, we it, it, it says in here that CARES has a software program which they may or may not be using for animal intake. They use a lot of paper and pencil maybe double posting animals, so that kind of makes me question all of this data. And then the fact that CARES had 2,800 calls for 48,000 for 48, residents compared to double that number for a million people? Yeah. You said that urine demands a lot from its animal control? I mean, it looks like urine is extremely high maintenance. So, yes. um, I, I question all of those numbers. Just to, just to clarify, uh, Denise didn't know exactly what she noted, that they're doing a lot of hand entry. She never uh, said that there was anything suspect about the veracity of their numbers. No, but she did know, you know that it could be that animals could be put in there twice, or some animals She, might she not never be suggested in there. that the numbers or the statistics they're giving us were in error at all. She just said that they could be doing it more efficiently. Right, exactly. Right. So um, just please read this. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, my name is uh, Pat Lemoyne, and I'd just like some clarification on some of these numbers because I'm looking at them and I'm a little confused here. And everybody seems to be talking about uh, the number of service calls between Burien and King County versus, uh, I like to compare that to the animal intake. And I guess uh, what defines a service call? Is that somebody saying we have a problem animal? Could you come and take care of that? In which case, I uh, would like to compare the animal intake for King County. Uh, if, if those are correlated together, wouldn't uh, you say that uh, King County, you take the 4,754 divided by the 5,392, and you'd have a success rate percentage, and uh, do the same thing with the 2860 or 340, 304 divided by the 3860. Wouldn't that give you a six rate for the uh, CARES here in Burien, or what exactly defines? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I really wasn't satisfied with the way we displayed uh, those numbers. We just got them on Friday. When we come back in April, we'll break them down so we even clear for you. Okay. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, like I say, it just seems numbers are accurate between the difference uh, of it. So thank you. There, there are a couple. Uh, so there are the number of animals that still in their care, and also the number of uh, animals that are dead on arrival, for example. Uh, uh, some of those numbers are attributed to the total number of animal intake. We'll, we'll bring back that information to kind of clarify. Those are good numbers. Great. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Robson. Okay, I wanted to add a few comments on what just been going on. For one thing, according to the uh, city profile, SeaTac has 27,000 people, which is just over half of Burien's population. But I was looking at the numbers on this slide, and, and it confirms what I've thought for a while that we're really trying to do animal control on the cheap. You compare the numbers on there, uh, the, the budget numbers compared to what we've done, we're paying $50 per call compared to King County's paying over $1,000 per call. We're paying $400 for each animal that's picked up compared to over $1,000 per animal. 
We've got one officer for a population of 48,000 compared to about one officer for 90,000 people for King County. Uh, I was not terribly surprised that there were a number of deficiencies found in the inspection that what you do an audit for is to tell you where you need to pick up. I mean, it's just like if you own a building and the fire department comes through and inspects, they're going to find things that you fix. And my expectation is that CARES will do that. The problem is we're doing it on the cheap to the point that I hope they have enough money to do it. And they're spending right now, what I got out of the audit is a little over 120000 a year because they're getting our cash, plus they're getting some contributions, plus they're getting quite a bit in in-kind contributions. So they're not doing it on the 120000 a year, and it's only costing us 60 because we're keeping the license fees. So, and I wanted to respond to Jack's point about trying to raise license fees. I think based on 60,000 and 120, you'd have to about triple the license fees that you're collecting in order to, to get enough money to actually support CARES from license fees. King County doesn't even attempt to do that with its animal control, which is why cities pay so much for it and they keep the license fees. The, uh, and you run into problems. I mean, do we really want CARES to turn its focus away from uh, picking up distressed animals and doing what it does and turn it into more of a license fee collection agency, which is more of what King County Animal Control does. And the other thing you have is that if you raise the license fees, I suspect that, like anything else, as the price goes up, compliance goes down. More people will say, well, I'm I gotta pay 50 bucks or 75 bucks or 100 dollars for a license. I'm just not gonna buy one. So I'm not. I, I like the idea of making licenses available through more outlets and hopefully increasing license sales that way. But I don't think we can. I, I don't think it's at all realistic to try and count on paying for all of our animal control through license fees. And I think we've been doing it on the the cheap too long. And we need to uh, put up enough money so that CARES can do the job that we want them to do. Thank you, Councilman Walker. Yeah, I, I think it's unfortunate that uh, my comments were uh, misunderstood. I did not say increase license fees. So we have to sell the licenses. Right now, it's it's very difficult for a person to to buy a license. I shouldn't say it's more difficult, but they have to make an extra effort to buy a license. They go to let's see, uh, White Center uh, Licensing, QFC down in uh, Normandy Park, across the street or City Hall. They have to reach out to buy a license. What I'm proposing is that we increase the number of outlets that people are are able to buy a license at. And through that, it sell more licenses so we can raise more revenue. Um, as a fundraising effort, I think it would be a great, great thing for CARES and its volunteers to uh, push for. You know, I noticed uh, that there are a number of animals that are, that, uh, are publicized on the blog and, and in the Highland Times that, uh, that uh, CARES is looking for their owners. How many of those animals have their pet licenses? Asking me? Yeah, or Deborah. Thank you. You know, probably about 25% of all the animals who pick up the license the rest of our license. We sell licenses in our office. We sell between five and ten hours a week. Yeah, well, I think, I think that uh, there's an opportunity for you to uh, move and uh, use that as a fund as well. We had talked about that, and it's certainly something we can bring back next, uh, next time we come back. I think it would be helpful if we get licenses to be purchased and renewed online also. Yes, yes. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, seeing no further comments, I'll just, I'll, I'll just wrap up. Um, one, one comment.
comment I would like to point out is that animal control is something that local governments have always struggled mightily with. And King County is no exception. They've historically had serious, serious problems. And frankly, I think to be able to start this for the amount of money we're, we're spending is remarkable. And so I would like to um, applaud Mr. George, Mr. Helms, and all the volunteers that have done this. Um, so with that, though, um, see no further comments. We'll move on to the next topic. Thank you. Good evening, Council uh, Mayor. Again, one again, this uh, management analyst. The purpose of this agenda item on page 37 is for Council to review and to discuss Ordinance uh, 579 to give reduced pet license fee to disabled persons. Currently, our municipal code provides reduced pet license fee to senior residents, but not to disabled persons. This ordinance would enable us to give a $15 license fee to disabled persons. This license fee, just like a fee for senior residents, is a lifetime fee for older people. Uh, and the applicant, the applicant must show the proof of disability, uh, which could be an ADA uh, parent transit card, that could be social security disability benefit, or it could be verification from a healthcare professional. Uh, Staff also would like to uh, take this opportunity to update the municipal code to reflect the correct rate for outer pet, which is twenty dollars instead of fifteen dollars. So this includes the introduction of one and five seven nine staff ready to take on council comments and question. This is a largely administrative. Um, somebody brought it to our attention that we didn't have a, a special license fee for the same folks. We don't get lots of requests for this. Um, but it's an easily fixable and appropriate. Councilman Rick. Thank you. Can you please repeat that last uh, change you said about $20? Sure. Uh, uh, staff would like to update the uh, municipal code to reflect the correct rate for Ultra Pet, which is $20 instead of $15. There's an incorrect rate in the uh, BMC that needs to be corrected to $20. Okay, thank you. And then I, I do have a follow-up question. Maybe it's just the way I'm reading the, uh, the ordinance. It appears that in the, the last line that unaltered uh, licenses would be $50. <coughs> altered would be $20. And then if it's a juvenile person purchasing license, a senior or a disabled person, uh, it would be zero for uh, juvenile and 15 for uh, disabled and senior. Question I have, it sounds like the senior citizen and the disabled um, person could have an unaltered. No, no sir. Uh, we adopted our uh, policy procedure from King County and King County specifically said that the pet have to be altered and the uh, applicant must show proof. So we do require that for for our city. Councilman yeah. Ross, I I actually had the same question about as you mentioned, Walter, but it doesn't mention that in the ordinance here. Do we need to make a change in the ordinance to specify that, or I guess we can we could do that. There is uh, an ambiguity, I agree, that could be corrected just by inserting the word altered, both in the uh, $15 rate for senior and the $15 rate for the city. And then I also have a question about juvenile. Now, are we talking about a person that's underage or an animal that's not an adult? Uh, an animal. Okay. Yeah. So Under six months old, I believe. So families can't go and just license all their pets with the kids and not pay anything. It's a good idea, game not. Good watching. Councilman Block. I'd like to see this uh, on the consent agenda with the uh, word altered where it's appropriate. I would also. Thank you. Uh, with clarifying the, uh, the price changes and the uh, including altered in both, it's also um, hard to tell about the lifetime, so can we include that also? Yes. Thank you. Okay, 
Okay, so uh, we got a couple of um, approvals for the consent agenda. Any additional? Okay, so with that, thank you very much, thank you. Mr. Newman. And we'll move on to the last item tonight, which is further discussion of district. Yes, sir. Uh, the purpose of this agenda item on page 41 is to respond to council wish to further discuss the issue of council districting. Tonight, staff bring back answer to council question from the February 25th meeting. The first question was, what would happen if there were no candidates from a district? The answer is, if there were no candidates from a district at the initial formation of the district, then one of the incumbents would be appointed to fill the district vacancy per RCW 29A24201 or the position could be filled by council appointment per RCW 2.17.070. If there were no candidates from the district at the subsequent elections, then per RCW 29A24201, the incumbents would remain in the office until the next election or until he or she resigned, at which time the vacancy would be filled by council appointment. The second, uh, the second question or the request from council was to direct staff to present some possible distributing map. So on page 41 through page 46, staff uh, attached some illustrated maps of the city with seven, six, five, and four districts. Please keep in mind that this is purely an exercise from an IT standpoint, just to see whether we can do this by combining voter precinct. The answer is yes, we can. Uh, however, if one, we want to do this as easily as possible, then we might need to uh, consider combining census tracts. Also, the King County Election Office told us that they need to receive the adopted uh, district boundaries by April 1st. So this concludes the uh, introduction of the districting issue and start be ready for council comments and questions. Okay. Any questions or comments, Councilor Rawson? Okay, I had some comments. The, the first one had to do with this whole altering or letting the elections board know in advance. And the, the statute that cited this refers to altering precinct boundaries. If the if districts were created, what I get from that is if districts were created just by using existing precincts without changing the boundaries of any of the existing precincts, then that would not apply. So are you saying that, that that's not correct, that it would require all this advance notice to the election board, even if we weren't altering any of the precincts? Yes, that's the word that we, we received from King County Election Office. Th this is a really squishy area, and to get this information uh, took a great deal of effort in uh, reminding them that we just installed a new ballot box out of the 152nd form. Um, but there, to your point, though, I think uh, some of this is to accommodate the fact that um, they're sending out ballots to places that they haven't sent them out for, and they're sending them out differently. In order to make that deadline, um, this was the deadline they gave us. Okay. And that works out to be April 1st? Roughly three weeks before the uh, yes, uh, as you can see, there's the paragraph kind of explain it to how we get to be April 1st. I, I think it's, I, I don't think that they're used to, they're accustomed to having something come this close to the, you know, pushing the deadline. And so they, they did their best to give us this information, and I believe Well, they, okay, yeah. I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves when we start talking about what the district should be drawn like before you even get to the point of deciding we're going to do them. Uh, with respect to the issue about what happens if there's vacancies, the, the statute provides pretty clearly what happens to the existing seats. Uh, if the, you know, one ward is being represented by more council members than the number to which is entitled, those have an insurance on expired terms would be assigned by the council to where there is a vacancy. So, so you're, everybody's going to have a seat. And then when you come up to the next election, the city member keeps their seat. If no one applies, and no one applies in the extended period, 
when the sitting member keeps their seat, if they resign or refuse to take the oath of office, then a replacement will be appointed by the remaining members of the council, the same as happens if somebody dies or resigns while they're in office. So we're not going to have big vacancies or special elections. So I just, I just want to make sure those things are clear. Okay. Uh, any further questions or comments from the public? Uh, Councilmember Block. Yeah, this uh, this issue of whether or not to uh, provide our cities and awards, um, I feel it's not a decision that uh, this council should be making. I feel it's a decision that should go before the voters. So I want to make my stand on that very clear. Space guy, and I think uh, the Council of Burien faces many complicated issues. And uh, changing the uh, election system of council members from at large, as we have now, to election by wards is an unnecessary complication. So I'm very much opposed to the ward system that's been suggested, or district system. Uh, there's a principle called the KISS principle. Keep it simple and sweet. Uh, one complicated issue that you have to deal with is the horrible unemployment uh, situation in Burien. When you have long-term people unemployed in Burien, that is a complicated issue that you should be thinking about rather than creating complicated issues like the war system. So stay with your present election. I, I recommend that you stay with your present election system of at large council members instead of going to the war system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, this is a very complicated uh, issue. decision obviously so I sense a lot of fear over this there's I've heard feelings on both sides the reading I've done has indicated that uh, voting by districts where you have the kind of disproportionate representation that Burien has had in the past voting by districts is the way to cure that the uh, and I would agree with the idea of setting up a, a committee specifically to study that and then report back to the council on it. I would urge that such a committee not have a council member on it. I agree. And uh, it include members from every part of the city. The, uh, and then I want to 
point out one thing with respect to putting it up for an election. I don't think we can. As one of the cities in the north found, uh, the statute says the council of a non charter code city, et cetera, may abide city in the wards or change the boundaries of existing wards. It doesn't say anything about the people changing it. And if I understood that decision correctly, that means that we could not put it up to a vote. It's a decision that the city council has to stand up and make. I agree the city council has to make it, but that doesn't mean you can have an advisory ballot. Mr. Knudsen, we've debated advisory ballots for years, especially around annexation, and previous councils said, no, we aren't going to put an advisory ballot to decide whether annexation will come or go based on the Burien population. So that's one thing I just want to remind all on council, that advisory uh, ballots have been something that the council has great difficulty with and would certainly lead to a very involved discussion. I truly am concerned when I look at the distribution of council members. When we have five west of Ambon and two east of Ambon, and only one that's north of the true city center, I think this puts great bias into the decisions that are made. It's unfortunate that people don't consider running for council unless they're retired or white, or are not bound by creating a, a source of income for their family. I think the city's been very fortunate in the council members we've had in the past, but we are not representing either the newly annexed area or the east side of our city. And I'm thinking that as we go through this discussion, maybe Mr. Robinson will bring us more reasons why districting is something that's going to make the council more aware of the areas that are truly not represented and haven't been represented in the past. So I'm very interested to see how this discussion will move forward. Councilman Block. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, all due respect to Councilman McGillen, um, we're talking about the basic form of government, of governance of our city. I think that uh, the citizens have every right to at least have an opportunity to uh, at least advise us how they feel. So I feel it's wholly appropriate to uh, at least have an advisory vote if we're not allowed to have a direct election in regards to this. Um, as to the matter of, of attracting people to this position, I've uh, already committed political hairy theory by suggesting this. I'm going to point this out again. You know, we're, uh, we're asked to do about 20 to 30 hours a week you know, do this job. That's a significant amount of time. If you have a family, um, it makes it very difficult or another job to be able to do that. Um, we're getting $600 a month for this. You know, we have to look at it realistically. Are we doing everything we can to make sure that we can attract people to this to this job. People, I feel, want to serve, but they have other considerations like mortgages and families that they have to consider too. You know, you're absolutely right. You know, it is that it is unfortunate that uh, that you know the only people that can afford to uh, uh, serve are retired people or wealthy people. So I think that we need to. Uh, well, I'm sorry, it's late. It's not coming out right, but you know, it, it's just uh, something that uh, um, I think that we need to address, and, and that's uh, our council compensation. You know, there are cities that are smaller that recognize this problem and, and uh, compensate their council members at a higher rate than, than we do. And uh, if we're going to uh, be able to attract people for this job, we have to recognize that uh, there is a certain amount of sacrifice in, times, in time and finances 
and uh, that uh, we need to uh, address the issue also. Mr. Klein, did you wish to comment? Thank you, Mayor Bennett. I did wish to comment. I, I think I just heard that uh, if the council uh, wanted to vote, uh, the seven of you could vote for uh, one of the other forms of government, whether it was a strong mayor or whether it was the, uh, the ward districting type situation. And it sounds like uh, uh, the city attorney, Mr. Knudsen, mentioned that uh, it would not necessarily or, or could not go, might not go to a vote of the citizens. I'll throw another option at you. Whether it's strong mayor or whether it's uh, wards or districts, would we be able to get a citizen vote if that uh, either of those concepts were brought to you in the form of a petition or an initiative? And, and I, I wonder if Mr. Knudsen might have an answer on that. When I made the comment about advisory ballots, I was just talking about in implementing a ward system for selecting council members. I wasn't talking about changing forms of government. That has its own separate process. Okay. Then I guess I'll ask the question, uh, uh, or throw the option out there a little differently. With regard to wards or districts, would a citizen vote be possible if it came to you by way of petition or initiative? That would be, and the reason I ask this question is, I believe either option needs to have a citizen vote. Thanks very much. Well, I think that goes to the Red Lake case that I was talking about, where Court said that no. If the, if the statute says the council has to do it, then you can't put it off on people. A point of information on the issue of changing form of government from uh, council manager to uh, council mayor. The statute points out two paths. One is uh, for the council to vote to uh, put it on the ballot or uh, for a petition to be presented to the council by 10% of the registered voters on presentation of that petition, then it is required to be put on the ballot. So I'm just saying that for uh, clarification for uh, Mr. Clinton. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Council Member Clark? Yeah, I have to the idea of the committee. I agree with Council Member Robinson that we uh, not have a council member on. Uh, I do think we need to have an odd number of people and seven from seven different parts of the city I think would be adequate. And, um, and then have them come back with a decision that council would have to act on before the end of this year when they came the uh, new board uh, or district process um, applicable after this election. That's what I've been trying to push. Okay. As for Robinson, you have a comment? Uh, I agree with Councilmember Clark, and I was going to comment that this, the discussion of the mayor system and paper for council members goes quite a bit beyond the subject matter that we were discussing. It should be something for a different meeting later on. I agree. Thank you. If we're um, considering uh, continuing this discussion, um, how much time and staff time have we put in so far? What's our um, what's the dollar value, and what's the dollar value of, of going forward with this? Uh, you know, what did you say? Did you spent thirty hours on this so far, yeah. and, and you make eight dollars an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you're not volunteering like uh, Ms. George? <laughs> where's, your, where's your civic spirit? <laughs> I need money to buy this tie and suit. It's, it's a nice tie. Deputy Mayor Krakowiak's point is well placed, though. This is a major work plan item. And uh, it will take, if, if we're going to give this a sort of diligence that a 
decision like this takes, I'm going to ask Council to arrive at a consensus to do this uh, because uh, Jan and there will be many people involved, this including three of us sitting here, and we're, we're happy to do it, but I'm going to have to arrange the work plan because uh, that will take a significant amount of time. Okay, I appreciate that. And so my view on it is um, I, um, I think it's an issue that is worth considering. Uh, I'm concerned. I've heard from, frankly, from people on both sides of this issue since it's been brought up by Councilmember Robson. And um, part of the concern that I've heard from people who favor districts is that they, one, they don't feel that their neighborhoods are being represented um, by the council who doesn't live in their neighborhoods. But also, I'm concerned that there's not even a discussion taking place between the sense, the, the impression I've gotten from talking to people is that they don't even feel that there's an avenue for them to communicate with uh, certain council members. And so that the views aren't even really being shared and they would feel much more comfortable. And they told me they would feel much more comfortable if there was one of their neighbors that was on the council um, discussing issues with them and not having to um, deal with some of the issues we've got now with personal attacks taking place. I think Mr. Dacey made a very apt comment on this, that it's, it's become difficult um, for a lot of people to take part and just communicate with the council in, in our current atmosphere, and I think that districting is a, uh, would be a way to address that. Uh, with that, though, um, as far as the committee, I'm, I'm concerned about just appointing a committee, an ad hoc committee. Um, that would um, have quite a bit of influence. Uh, so if we were going to appoint a committee, what I would ask that we consider is maybe just uh, putting it on the planning commission agenda, since they, they have been appointed, um, if we were going to consider that. But as, as far as timing, another thing I wanted to throw out there is that the state legislature is considering this issue right now. Mm -hmm. And so what I would ask is that we maybe wait and see what the legislature decides. It's not in their job description, but I'm sure they'd be happy to do it. It, it, it wouldn't satisfy, the council uh, was interested in having people from different geographic places in the city that may not uh, satisfy your wishes in that regard, but there's nothing that would prevent them from talking about it. Um, I would be willing then to wait until June. Does that mean we would have a further discussion? I, I would like to. Yeah. The council wants, uh, at that time, we'll know how the legislation has been proposed in 1149. Uh, it's come out, and we'll probably have some analysis about that. And it's suggested that there may be risks to cities who don't have districts who are not representative of their uh, minority populations, and they cite the Yakima case for that. So uh, we'll be glad to bring that back in June and kind of bring you up to date on where all that is. Okay. Is that acceptable to? Okay, so with that, I see no further comments. We will, um, can we get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.